What if I told you that there was a white civilization in the middle of Africa, built by Phoenicians who were descendants of European rulers? It is believed that they traveled all the way down to develop the gold trade in the region. At the time, the trade was dominated by the native black civilizations of Africa. Through a series of wars and conquests, the Phoenicians were able to develop a sophisticated civilization and even built a temple similar to Solomon's temple on Mount Moriah. The great civilization in what is now Zimbabwe was discovered by Karl Mauck, a German explorer and geologist who was searching for gold and precious stones when he first encountered the ruins in 1871. He was stunned by the construction. The walls were neatly created in a perfect circle and the designs integrated perfectly with nature, creating an indescribable feeling. Karl Mauch was in awe. He had found the first proof of white civilization in Africa. On that fateful day in his journals, he claimed that the local Africans he had spoken to had only lived in the area for about 40 years and that they were all convinced that white people once inhabited the region. These journals are also filled with drawings of artifacts that he found at the site with links in the ruins, the characters from the Bible. Karl Mauch knew he had found the city of Ophir, a wealthy trading post or port city mentioned in the Bible. He believed the ruins had once been the palace of the city's legendary ruler, the Queen of Sheba. According to the biblical narrative, the Queen of Sheba came from a land of great wealth. When she visited King Solomon in Jerusalem, she brought him valuable gifts, including gold, spices, and precious gems. It is evident from these gifts that her civilization was capable of producing such product. Based on Karl Mauch's theory regarding the wood beams, which he identified as cedar wood, an important export from Lebanon, he concluded that they had been brought by Phoenician traders. He reasoned that only Phoenician traders could have supplied this material, which was also used to construct Solomon's palaces. The British Empire and European civilization embraced Karl Mauch's suggested narrative because it provided a deeper link between Europe and Africa. The British Empire decided to investigate further and sent Theodore Bent, an archeologist, to lead the site's management. Bent led an expedition on behalf of the Royal Geographic Society and the British Association for the Advancement of Science. While exploring the site, Theodore Bent discovered stone bird carvings that resembled artifacts from Near Eastern and Mediterranean civilizations. This discovery led Bent to conclude that the site was actually built by Phoenicians and that Africans moved in only after the Phoenicians had abandoned it. Karl Mauch's discoveries were so important that a street is named after him in Peter Maritzburg and Falaborwa, South Africa. Additionally, there is a school named after him in the city of Stettin im Remstal in Germany. Some influential men have streets named in their honor and even more influential men have towns or even cities named after them. But how do you compare a man after whom large swaths of Africa were named? That man was Cecil Rhodes, who founded the colonies of southern and northern Rhodesia. Cecil John Rhodes was born on July 5, 1853. He served as the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony from 1890 to 1896. Through astute business dealings and amalgamations, he became the chairman of the De Beers Diamond Company. Cecil was a strong believer in the adage that to be born an Englishman was to win first prize in the lottery of life. He sought to bring this enlightenment to the many different states in South Africa by uniting the continent under British rule. To achieve this, he knew he needed funds on an even grander scale to pay for both military power and bribes to local tribal chieftains. Funds began to flow into the colony in 1886 when gold was discovered. By the age of 34, Cecil had monopolized control of the entire Kimberley Diamond Field. As one of the wealthiest people on earth, he devoted a significant portion of his personal fortune to acquiring territory and mining concessions for the advancement of the British Empire. During the European scramble for Africa, Cecil was focused on rapidly expanding British interests, seemingly at any cost. He led a military expedition into Matabeleland and through bribes and some underhanded dealings, eventually founded the colonies of northern and southern Rhodesia. Cecil Rhodes had now created not one but two countries inspired by his name. Through his vision and determination, he expanded the British Empire by almost 450,000 square miles, almost single-handedly. In the quest for more information on this ancient white civilization, 
Cecil Rhodes hired archaeologist and journalist Richard Hall to investigate further. Hall soon published a book entitled The Ancient Ruins of Rhodesia, in which he discussed his findings. In the book, Hall claimed that Great Zimbabwe had been constructed by more civilized races, also known as the white race at that time. Hall then began a period of restoration that involved removing layers of sediment up to two meters deep throughout the site with the goal of eliminating the filth and decadence of African occupation. During the early 20th century, many investigators allowed to explore the site were little more than treasure hunters. They destroyed valuable evidence in their pursuit of gold artifacts and other luxuries. The British Empire accepted and promoted this theory, among others, to justify white claims to African lands. Later theories attributed the site to ancient Egyptians, shipwrecked Vikings, and even the mythological inhabitants of Atlantis. Okay, I have to stop there. There were no white civilizations in this region of Africa. It was all a lie to prove a bigger point. In the process of archaeological research, scientists like Richard Hall destroyed much of the archaeological record that could have helped in understand the actual African civilization that built the site. For the British who were allowed to investigate the site after him, their actions made properly dating and studying the site more difficult for later historians and archaeologists. This highlights the danger of biases when discussing science. Such biases do not benefit anyone. The African society in question is the Kingdom of Zimbabwe, which existed from 1220 to 1450. The site that was key to this civilization is now known as the ancient city of Great Zimbabwe. There are several reasons why it is difficult to trace the society that ruled over Great Zimbabwe. Here is what we know. Archaeological remains suggest that settlers from the Kingdom of Mapungubwe in southern Africa established the Zimbabwe Plateau in the 11th century. These settlers brought with them artistic and stonemasonry traditions, which are still visible today in the archaeological and cultural evidence. The Kingdom of Zimbabwe was a medieval Shona Karanga kingdom located in modern-day Zimbabwe. It existed from 1220 to 1450 CE with its capital at Great Zimbabwe, a medieval African city known for its large circular wall and tower. Great Zimbabwe was part of a wealthy African trading empire that controlled much of the East African coast from the 11th to the 15th centuries. The name Zimbabwe comes from Zimba Zamabwe, translated from the Karanga language as large houses of stone. The kings of Zimbabwe were known as Mambos. The first notable Mambo was Chikura Wadyembo, who is a semi-historical figure. His son, Nayat Simba Mutota, is considered the first historical Mambo of the Kingdom of Zimbabwe. The people of Great Zimbabwe most likely worshipped Muari, the supreme god in the Shona religion. The kingdom was known for its trade routes and the supply of gold, ivory, and leopard skins. The most important king of the Kingdom of Zimbabwe was Mwene Mutapa, whose real name was Matopi. He ruled over the Zimbabwean plateau and a large swath of present-day Mozambique under Great Zimbabwean rule. His aggression earned him the nickname Mwene Mutapa, Great Raider or Great Pillager. Around 1450, he relocated the capital to Kami, perhaps to be nearer to gold deposits. Kami was another stone complex that was supplanted there in the 1680s by another Shona clan led by the chief. The city of Great Zimbabwe was largely abandoned during the 15th century, and its stoneworking and pottery-making techniques seemed to have transferred southward to Kami. The kings of Great Zimbabwe controlled thousands of kilometers of territory, but some of them did not conquer their lands with a massive army. Instead, the king received his authority to govern from a special connection to the spirits of deceased rulers who offered him guidance. This mystical link to the ancestors allowed him to exert spiritual control over the rulers of smaller settlements in the area. In addition to his spiritual authority, the king was responsible for providing food for his people. He owned thousands of cattle and likely oversaw the storage and distribution of surplus grain. Some scholars believe that Great Zimbabwe's famed conical tower was a symbolic grain storage bin and thus served as a reminder of the king's crucial role in the survival of the entire community. During the dry season, the farmers of Great Zimbabwe became gold miners. The gold they found contributed greatly to the empire's prosperity and along with ivory, was one of its major trade items. 
Great Zimbabwe obtained goods from all over the world through the Swahili trading ports on Africa's east coast. A great deal of evidence found at the site helps to prove Great Zimbabwe's connection to this global trade network. Archaeologists have uncovered a 14th century Arab coin, 13th century Persian pottery, as well as porcelain and glass beads from China's Ming dynasty. It is clear that this African civilization was connected to the world and traded with many different empires. Their masterful craftsmanship was responsible for building the awe-inspiring buildings of Great Zimbabwe and other cities. Unfortunately, during the colonial period, much of the evidence of Great Zimbabwe's successful trade networks was manipulated to support theories that a Caucasian civilization had built the site. I made this video to remind us that history can and will be changed if we allow it to be. As Africans, we have a unique responsibility to carry the stories of our ancestors and share them with the world. By doing so, we can help to ensure that the true narrative of our people is not lost or distorted by those who seek to exploit it for their own gain. The importance of preserving our history cannot be overstated. If this video has been informative and has helped you to understand the history of the Zimbabwe Kingdom a little better, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. It is only by working together that we can change the narrative surrounding African history. This is not just an issue of cultural pride. It is also a matter of justice. When people like Cecil Rhodes steal our stories and use them to create new countries in their own name, they are perpetuating a system of oppression that has plagued Africa for centuries. By reclaiming our history and telling our own stories, we can begin to dismantle this system and create a brighter future for ourselves and our descendants. So let us not be complacent in the face of those who seek to erase our past and rewrite our future. Let us stand up and take ownership of our history so that we can shape a better tomorrow for all of Africa. I hope you enjoyed this video. More videos about real African kingdoms are on the way. I will also cover more about the actual history of Zimbabwe soon. If you want to learn more about African kingdoms and history, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching, and until next time.